You know, and we all have our 15 minutes of fame, and I'd like to take a couple of my 15 minutes to talk about the rights and the wrongs in the world of professional wrestling. And it is for the WWE Championship. This match is for the ECW World Heavyweight Championship. Championship. Here we are, another week down and another episode of WOW in the books and another one to review. Hello folks, this is your host Mr. Green and I am ready to roll into another taping. Well, I shouldn't say taping. They've already taped these things months ago. So let me rephrase that. Another airing of WOW, Women of Wrestling. And it's going to occupy a fair chunk of the show. In fact, I'm going to try to go right on through the news just because I think there's more stuff that is wow oriented to talk about opposed to the things that's going on outside of it. But all the same, we still have to address whatever goings on that happened to be in the, uh, the world of pro wrestling. As it relates to the women, of course. So that is what we're going to do. So we're going to start off here and go into the news, views, and updates. And I guess we should begin with Stephanie Vakur, allegedly or reportedly, has signed with the WWE, despite the fact that she was just in, what was that, the Forbidden Door pay-per-view with the... Mercedes Monet, and she chose to go with WWE. Good on her. You know, nothing against um, uh, necessarily AEW, but it's probably going to be, be a better thing for her overall in the long run if she had a choice between the two of them. Because I, I have lost all hope <laughs> or faith that AEW can properly run their di- women's division much less a lot of the stuff that's in there if you aren't part of the five or six people at the top of the cards you how you used is going to be a coin tossed uh cj perry or lana as some people may remember her apparently has stated that she's finished over aew I wasn't even aware that she was still there. Probably didn't really want to be all that much, you know, inside of the wrestling environment anyway. Uh, and I know that most of her aspirations seem to lean towards acting. Oh, gosh, that sounds familiar. But anyway, yeah, most of her aspirations seem to lean towards acting. And I just I don't think that wrestling was a, a high mark for her. as it was, it was a means to an end. Which also sounds familiar. But she did uh, speak about her current status. And she simply said, my time with them is just has just finished. Um, she, surprisingly to me, clarified that she wanted to be in the business as a manager. And she said this, I'm really focused on finding talent and cultivating them and helping them become the best wrestler champion possible. I guess you could say I want to be the Paul Heyman. But she's got a lot of work to be able to accomplish that. To be able to accomplish being the Paul Heyman. I mean, that's rare air that she's talking about there. Heyman is one of the single best, they don't call them managers anymore, but single best managers that wrestling has. I mean, there's a short list of people who fall into that category. You talk about your Bobby Heenan's and Jimmy Hart's and, and... Jim Cornette's and Paul Heyman's, uh, d- 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 Ellering, Paul Ellering. I just stumped myself there for a second. <clears throat> and there's probably several others. I mean, you can go, you can go down to some of the next tier guys like Teddy Long and Slick and <clears throat> Fuji. Um, 
you know, they got the Lanny Pavo. These anomaly people that could at least talk on the behalf of their their guys and not necessarily talk on behalf of them as a character. They could talk on behalf of them and really say some stuff and get you interested in it. And matter of fact, most of those people that I mentioned had enough heat and equity on them alone that if somebody just came in with them, they they was elevated almost immediately. Not necessarily to the main event, but they were elevated. Uh, so yeah, she's got some big um, shoes to fill, <laughs> or if that is what her goal is to be. Reportedly, Alexa Bliss is training for a comeback. Gosh, when was the last time we even seen her? But former five-time WWE Women's Champion Alexa Bliss is planning or training for a return to the ring, and she did give us some footage. Of her, you can go and seek that out. Good on Alexa Bliss, who doesn't really get <clears throat> regarded as much as uh, some of her contemporaries as being a, a good wrestler. But when she does come back, I hope she comes back as just the Five Feet of Fury, opposed to another member of the Wyatt Six or the Fiend 2.0. Natalia. Has reportedly signed a new WWE contract. Not surprising. This comes out of Pro Wrestling Insider Elite. They had been uh, reportedly, they said there was speculation over the past couple of months whether she was going to resign or not. Uh, both parties were in talks, but a decision ultimately had not been made. Apparently, that is no longer the case as they are now reporting her resigning. I'm sure. If that is true, it will be verified in short order. Like I said, I don't think that's any big surprise that she would go back. I thought that's, I was hoping, hoping that she would take, you know, a little little time out of, of WWE, maybe see some other places, participate in some other places. But even if she's in WWE at the moment, I would think, or I would again hope, they might. Lend her out. WWE seems a bit more flexible about that now. So, I know I said it in one of the other podcasts, but her in WWE is probably not going to go all that far. Uh, She's been there for, how long? Almost a, a solid 20 years. Straight. It's not like she was fired and came back and or quit and went around the world and came back. She's been there since 2007. And I'm pretty sure it's kind of like a Dolph Ziggler situation when they had this, like, we know what we got with him and whatever aspirations they had on making him the guy kind of went away more, more so that we, we got a guy who can work really good and he can put other people over, which is basically the spot that Natalia was in. She's, works really good and she could put other people over not a bad place to be but if she wants to reinvigorate her in-ring career it might be might be a good idea to lend her out and they've they've done some cross promotion with tna wrestling why not go there why not have a compete for the TNA title. Why not Why not just lend her out on excursion for like three months? We've seen more and more crossover. The Rascals showed up on NXT. They had a Rascals reunion, a team that had worked in TNA. Never stepped foot in WWE, but, you know, that they're, they're chanting for the Rascals in NXT's arena. Dempsey made his appearance in, in TNA. Uh, Hendry made his appearance in NXT. Of course, we all know Jordan Grace was like the catalyst. She she kicked that whole thing off. But yeah, I would not be surprised or or shocked if they decided to let her go. In fact, I, I would be rooting for it. And as a sidebar, how good is it for them to be doing work with TNA right now? And I don't just mean the fact that, you know, hey, we got some crossover going because 
as talented as some of the people are on NXT, I, I'm trying to think of a good way to say it, but very few of them are big names. They work really well, and they're good for that audience, which is why I'm glad they have a small little studio to do their thing. But they do not have a lot of big names there. When we really look through it, now they just started hiring some new people. Got Ethan Page, all ego Ethan Page, who just won the NXT Championship. Um, you had uh, the former Brian Pillman Jr., I think he's Lexus King now, who, you know, hadn't really made a name for himself, quite honestly. He, he, his name is built off his father. But he, but he can get there. And um, I forget who he was as the perfect 10. Uh, he just came back. I'm sure his name will pop back in my head. Spears. Sean Spears. So you have those three. But by and large, I mean, Andre Chase, Axon, Brooks Jensen, Channing Lorenzo, Charlie Dempsey, Dante Chin, Deion Lennox, Duke, Duke Hudson, Eddie Thorpe. You know, they, these are the names that exist on there. Adriana Grace, Adriana Rizzo, Cora Jade, Fallon Henley, Gigi Dolan, JC Jane, Jakira Jackson. As talented as a lot of them are, they haven't gotten to the point where they're names yet. Comparatively speaking, look at the people who are on TNA's roster. And I know that is probably a hard thing, and I, I'm, I'm way out of women's wrestling right now. But I, I know it's kind of a hard thing to look at them and, and even think that they would have more names on their roster than any WWE brand. But just listen to the Moose, who's been on the Indies forever and been part of Ring of Honor. Jordan Grace, who's been on their TV and has probably become a bigger name now than, than, than before. Mustafa Ali just popped back in there. Eddie Edwards and Brian Myers both been in um, WWE and, and various other locations. Ash by Elegance, we know her from WWE also. And it's, they got people who were big names as indie stars. And in TNA's past, your Frank, Frankie Kazarian's, your Havocs, your Jashelle Shaw's, Alex, Alexander Hammerstone. <clears throat> the Hardys had just popped back in there. Jonathan Gresham, former Ring of Honor champion. Joe Hendry. I mean, it, and this is just the people that I'm seeing, you know, just running down the list. Matt Cardona, <clears throat> Speedball, Mike Bailey, PCO, the Rhino. I mean, they easily have more stars at this time than... NXT. And as that is, it works out better for both of them. NXT can go back and forth with some of their talent, build it up, build up their brand. Pretty much the same thing that Triple H did, except for they're not hiring people. They're just kind of doing an exchange. And TNA gets more exposure. Keeps them relevant. Keeps them alive. At this stage, it's a win-win. So back to the point. How great would it be to see a Natalia versus Jordan Grace match? Or Natalia just compete for the NXT Women's Championship at all? I'm mean, not NXT, sorry. Uh, compete for the TNA Knockouts Championship at all. How great would that be? Speaking of championships, Sari was crowned the inaugural Marigold World's Champion. So, congratulations to her. Uh, that happened apparently after a 25 minute match, and it ended due to ref stoppage. And she is now the new, well, new. There's only been one, and she's it. <laughs> so, it's, so, yeah, Sari is now the first. Marigold champion. Uh, it, it was reported that EO Sky participated in the Summer of Destiny event. Um, and she was she was a winner in that. This is another case of them lending people out. You know, I got to say this about Triple H and whoever else has made that decision. 
one of the big things that wrestling has always kind of had working against them is that, hey, how are you calling people independent contractors when you control everything they do and you won't let them go anywhere else? Well, they're, they're slowly taking bit by bit some of that off of the table. I, I'm I'm proud of it. I mean, it, it is a exciting thing to see when you get these kind of little crossovers. I, I know they don't need to do it all the time, but it, it's, it's cool. I, I enjoy it. Uh, as I just talked about Marigold and Sari, I just want to sidebar for a second before I go off into the, the wow news, not the review, but the wow news. And I just have to say this because I watched it not all that long ago. It was a uh, stardom uh, championship match with the aforementioned Sari taking on Mayu Iwatani. I hope I'm pronouncing the names right. And my gosh, that was a match. That was a match. You didn't have to understand a single word of Japanese to follow that match. That is everything that I've been saying that WoW needs that every once in a while. They need that every once in a while, that, that match that can go a little longer so they can tell the story. And these two ladies told a story. It was... And it, uh, it was uh, like a brutal fight. And like just a, a hair underneath not being a work. <laughs> it's like just a hair. That's what it felt like at least. You can look at this and you'll see just the out and out struggle to gain or retain the championship. And it was everything that the champion could do to survive it. I mean, she she went above and beyond and it, it the body language was so good. She looked worn out, tired, fighting against all the odds, just drained of everything. And they were going hard hit. And, and it's not like you had a out and out heel and an out and out baby face, at least not as far as you could tell. But you had an aggressor who was probably Sari. So she was the de facto heel in this. And you had the sympathetic baby face in here who, like I said, fighting against all odds, struggling to, just to get her breath and find a way to just to get the strength, the energy to, to fight back. Iwatani was the sympathetic baby face, and they did just a magnificent match. If you get the chance to watch it, you should go out of your way to see this. I am going to, if I remember, I'm going to put the link uh, so you can check it out. I do not get anything off of mentioning stardom. I just want, this is just me having seen this match and saying that. This was, no pun intended, worlds apart from what we watch and what I review here on a week-to-week -week basis. Not that there aren't people in that promotion, while I'm speaking of, that can't perform it. But it's an apples and oranges comparison. It, it, or other word, in other words, let me not mumble. It is not an apples to apples comparison to look at one and then say, well, they should do the same thing. Uh, stardom is a bigger promotion. Stardom performs in larger locations. Stardom, um, I don't know what that television situation is, but when we're looking at it in pay-per-view terms and we're looking at it on streaming and YouTube and whatnot, they can deliver. They're not restrained by the same time that WoW does. So I understand, but I would still suggest that they watch this in some regards just to take a few hints. Just a few. This is only a suggestion. Ah, okay. So I, I just, now that I've uh, gone through that and Given my little dissertation on how good the start of match was, 
And please, if I don't have the link up there, you know, uh, or in the description, somebody just shoot me a message. Say, hey, what about that match? Because otherwise I might forget. Uh, Going over into the wild news. I had just gotten a press release. So I think it is important to go through and read this release. And then we'll go into review in and of itself. This press release um, is talking about WoW reappearing at the San Diego Comic-Con. This is not their uh, first go-round in that event, but they are going to be coming back. And I just, after I read this, I was like, yeah, I, I, I do think I need to talk about that one. So allow me to read you the press release. It was titled Media Alert for the first time WOW Women of Wrestling takes the stage at San Diego Comic-Con. Now, in this email, they also give a limited edition poster. I will talk about the poster in a minute. I might just go ahead and and upload it onto the the page or channel or whatever platform I have. Uh, Special panel sessions featuring WOW Women of Wrestling co-owners Jeannie Buss and David McLean, along with WOW Superheroes Coach Campanelli and Genesis to be presented on Friday, July 26th in San Diego. WOW fans will receive an exclusive limited edition poster at the autograph signing prior to the panel. That's the poster I was just talking about. And they gave me a little download link. Now, before I even go any further with that, I just want to say something about this poster. It is a nice collage. I won't say that is bad, but I will not. <laughs> I won't say that is a great one either. And only because when I had to deal with people who did graphic designs for posters and things like that, I was like, I, I seen people who had no budget who had posters that was so creative and and beautiful. And in fact, I've seen fan art of wow uh, superheroes that look fantastic hire one of them this just looks like we took every png file that we had and just put it over top of a rainbow background and slapped wow on top of it and we put genie bus in the middle and made sure that she was at least twice the size of everybody else there and that was my first sign to what i'm probably going to say later on as i read this And I and before I even go, that that was my first thought when I looked at this post. I was like, why is Jeannie Bus in the middle of this? Because it she's a larger figure in this, so it's the is damn near the first thing that your eyes will be drawn to no matter what. She's bigger than everybody else and she's wearing white. <laughs> this is whereas everybody else has got like dark colors and stuff like that. So yeah, it's it's very easy to lock in on her. I was like, but why is she on this poster? She didn't participate on the show. She's not a personality on the show. She doesn't show up on it. All they do is just bring her up and she's in the credits. So why is she on this poster? But maybe that's just me. (laughs) Maybe that's just me. So let's read this, shall we? Oh, yeah, by the way, Zantara, this one's for you. That ain't PepsiCo. So if anybody's going to sue me over that one, that's going to be (laughs) Anheuser-Busch. I just had to share that with you since uh, you time-marked my my, my PepsiCo comments. Or Pepsi comments or whatever. Sierra, Mist, Breeze. I can barely remember it. All right, so here we go. Let's read it. For the first time, for the very first time, WOW Women of Wrestling, the premier all-female sports entertainment property, will present a special panel at this year's San Diego Comic-Con. WOW Women of Wrestling, bringing WOW superheroes to life on Friday, July 26th from 5.30 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. in Room 6DE at the San Diego Comic-Con Convention Center. Join co-owners Jeannie Buss and David McLean along with Wow Superheroes Coach Campanelli and Genesis as they discuss the importance of the rise of the female representation in professional sports, the influence of comics on pro wrestling, and a preview of Season 3 of Wow Women of Wrestling. 
ahead of the panel, David McLean, Coach Campanelli, and Genesis will participate in an autograph signing from 12.30 p.m. to 1.15 p.m. in the San Diego Comic-Con Center Room 33C, where fans will get an exclusive limited edition wild poster as part of the signing. About Women of Wrestling. Wow, Women of Wrestling is the premiere. All, they are going to beat that into the ground. Whew. Okay, let me let me continue. Wow, Women of Wrestling is the premiere. All female sports entertainment property co-owned by co-owned and co-founded by the trailblazing sports executive Jeannie Buss and David McClain, who is the founder of the original Glow, Gorgeous Ladies of Wrestling, led by the larger than life Wow superheroes. And their in-ring rivalries. WoW is an action-packed saga that plays out at high-energy live events and in weekly syndication across the U.S. As the only all-female wrestling organization with a global footprint, WoW showcases supreme athleticism, dramatic and inspiring stories, and is centered 24-7 around empowering and uplifting women and fans around the world. The series is distributed by Paramount Global Content Distribution. About the panelists. Yes, this is long. Just stick with me. Jeannie Bus, controlling owner and president of the Los Angeles Lakers. Jeannie Bus has been named by ESPN as quite possibly the most powerful woman in all the sports. As a child, comic book characters such as Wonder Woman and Supergirl captivated Jeannie. Today, she is intent on empowering women and engaging fans by introducing them to the world of WOW, a place where women are the stars and fight their own battles. For Jeannie, WOW represents a whole new universe of modern-day real-life superheroes. David McLean. David McLean is no stranger to the wrestling world, having grown up in it since he was 16. While most thought that wrestling should and would remain a boys' club, David had a vision that women could be the stars of the ring. David's passion led him to create the very first all-women's wrestling TV program, GLOW, Gorgeous Ladies Wrestling. Today, with its partners, Genie Bus, Paramount Global Content Distribution, and Amazing Wild Superheroes, David continues to build the new future of women's wrestling. Blah, 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 blah. All right. Uh, good grief. Two more. <sighs> Hailing from San Diego, this is Coach Campanelli. Hailing from San Francisco, Coach Campanelli excelled at every sport she attempted. Softball, soccer, tennis, golf, pickleball, bocce ball, cheese rolling, underwater hockey, you name it. Coach Campanelli played it and probably was the captain of the team. After mastering every sport, she decided to bring her coaching abilities to WOW to teach them how to become true champions. Since arriving at WOW, Coach Campanelli has inserted her wisdom and coaching acumen, whether it was requested or not. With her red, white, and green tracksuit freshly pressed, laces tight, snugged, and the whistle properly polished, Coach Campanelli brings her unsolicited coaching tips to WOW with the purpose to win because that's what Coach Campanelli does. I will comment on all these in a moment. Last, Genesis. Hailing from a remote outback in Australia, Genesis learned how to cut an enemy before she knew how to make a friend. She was often alone, left to fend for herself with nothing but the dusty red dirt and lonely wind for company. Just as she started to make friends with other children, she was shipped off to boarding school, further isolating her from any love or <laughs> This is so stupid. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm sorry. Did not mean that. Let me let me uh Okay, I had to take a little swig there. <laughs> the other children. <laughs> I don't know why that why that tickled me so bad. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> all right. <laughs> Just, where did I even leave?
leave off. Oh. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> Just. <laughs> I am so sorry. <laughs> I don't know what happened right there. <laughs> Shit. <Okay. laughs> oh. <laughs> All right. Get it. Just as she started to make friends. <laughs> Just as she started to make friends with other children, she was shipped off to boarding school, further isolating her from any love or friendship. To pass the time, Genesis. <laughs> Genesis found joy in playing with dangerous toys, mastering the sword and the nunchuck. <clears throat> oh. Genesis also turned her body into a weapon, teaching herself karate and kung fu. Though she was lonesome and forgotten, Genesis never gave up on herself. Eventually, her journey led her to wrestling, where her fighting skills quickly made her a field's competitor within the squared circle. After finding success as part of the brutal faction of exile, Genesis fought her way to the top of the group's pecking order. But like the mother who eats her young, she caused a rift in the group by putting herself first, leading to exile disbanding forever. Now a feared singles competitor, Genesis no longer seeks family or belonging. Instead, she seeks vengeance for her suffering and a prize that can never betray her. To prove that the years of isolation and training had meaning by putting her body to the test and winning the WOW World Championship. Ah, oh, I, I am so sorry. I don't know why that made me laugh like that. I don't know what tickled. Other than I was like, her talking about friends with other children. I don't know why that just tickled me. Shipped off to boarding school. Now all of that could be legitimate. I don't know. I don't know what that young lady's background is, but it just sounded so absurd reading it. Okay, so <clears throat> get myself together. <sighs> the good. B bully for them that they got a, a panel at, at San Diego Comic Con. That is a, a plus because I've seen this strategy done multiple times. Not with WoW. Here, with the wrestling promotions here, they all do the same thing. There's a large, San Diego Comic Con is the big one on the, on the West Coast. On this end, in this region, the big one is Dragon Con. And every year, Dragon Con has a wrestling event. Why? You're filling out that you're filling out the hours. You're providing stuff for the panel, not the panelists, but for the attendees to do. And there are people that show up and watch the matches who don't know who any of them are. They're just watching it because they're there. A lot of the people that attend Comic Cons across the country travel in, it's especially the big ones, travel into them. I know that because I've covered like I used to cover uh, Dragon Con for like four years straight, <clears throat> and and you get to meet a lot of people while you're out there. I mean, there, there's tons, tons, thousands of feel like just walking through, just, just all tight and pressed up against each other. But you know, generally speaking, when they come there, they come in there for two or three reasons. One, a lot of them looking for reasons to be able to cosplay, which is that weekend that they're there, they are the stars. People come up to the attendees, hey, can I get a picture with you? Can I get your autograph? Stuff like that, right? 
<clears throat> two, they're coming in so they can get autographs and merchandise. Things that are generally pretty rare. Can't or you know, you can't find them as easily as you might have at some point. Internet might have changed that a bit, but still is it's nice to go and, and see the people that you're getting it from. And of course, lastly, to attend and interact, mingle with, or otherwise talk to some of the stars. That includes the Q&As, that includes the signing uh, <clears throat> areas and things like that. Every Comic-Con I've ever seen or gone to, and Dragon Con isn't the only one, I've traveled for a couple of those, there's always a wrestler's row. At least here. There's always been a wrestler's row. That's a, is what I call it. Because they always stick them in the same location and just line them up table by table and they sit there and they sign the autographs and so on and so forth. But they're usually people that have been on massive levels and scales and, you know, TV, TNT, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> so that's a lot of the, the reasons. I'm sure it's, there's others, but that's a lot of reasons. The major ones that I have perceived as why people go to that. The reason why I say this is a good thing for them is because it's a captive audience. People out of there are going to come just out of curiosity. Whether they know what WoW is or not, I'm sure there are going to be people be people that know exactly what wow is but <clears throat> some and i would say quite possibly a good majority of are going to just see it because it's there it's not a bad thing like i said this is the strategy that other promoters that i have seen used it's just a means to try to promote to that that audience which then goes back to the other thing. Now, you got some people that are coming in. They're going to see it, and then they're going to leave. So they may go back home and start watching it. But then you also have your locals. Your locals are going to be there, and they're going to feed in. Well, I shouldn't say they're going to feed into Wild Wow. Wild is theoretically should be feeding into them. Having them show up, seeing the banner, seeing her, having the Q&As and so on and so forth. Should be a means to help facilitate while getting more exposure and attention, so on and so forth. Now, they never do that in, in wrestling conventions. They do it at Comic-Con. <sighs> it's nice, but I, I would like them to do some wrestling stuff. But it's almost like WoW goes out of his way not to be associated with wrestling. <clears throat> Other than the fact that they have a wrestling ring and people wrestle. Go figure. But, like I said, the poster, I thought they could have did a better job on. You be the judge of that when you see it. I didn't think Genie Buzz needed to be front and center of that poster for no apparent reason. And then this whole thing here. Genie Buzz as a child related to combo characters as Wonder Woman and Supergirl. You mean like the two most known superhero women in the world? that whether you read a comic book or not, you know who they are. That's the same thing I say about when wrestlers go to TV studios and get interviews and the interview, you can always tell the interviewee if they knew wrestling or not. The ones that know it will bring up just arbitrary stuff. You remember that time when this happened and blah, 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 right? The ones that don't, that are just, getting the, the scoop or the story or whatever the case may be, usually will do one of two things all the time. One, they'll want to participate, play with, chop me, slam me, how do you do this? You know, they want to interact with the wrestlers one way or the other. And two, they'll bring up something that they saw, usually pertaining to yeah, I used to watch wrestling when it was, and you could fill in the blank for whoever the major star was, because there's always a major star that they name. There's always a Hulk Hogan, a Steve Austin, a Rock, a Roddy Pike, you know, names that everybody on earth knows whether they actually watch wrestling on a regular basis or not. I'm usually impressed when they bring up somebody that's just random. So if Jeannie Buss had told me that, you know, or if they wrote down like, oh, she read all kinds of comics. She was reading the Legion of Superheroes and Superman and Batman, you know, the Justice League. And she was collecting this, that, and the other. And if that were the case, then I would be impressed. But I, as of that, like, eh, Wonder Woman and Supergirl, 
that was the ones that captivated. And I'm not knocking her for it. You like, you like who you like, but it just sounds so made up. Sounds like something that we needed to put on this press release so that it fits into going into San Diego Comic-Con. I'm one of you guys. I read comic books too. I'm sure she can disprove that if she chose to do it. But I'm also sure that she won't. Uh, David McLean. Hey. You know what? I'm going to say whatever I have to say about David McLean until we get to review. Because he has some moments in there that just drove me up the goddamn wall. <clears throat> but whoever wrote this either does not watch the show or keep up with it or both. Coach Campanelli in her red, white, and green tracksuit. When was the last time she had that on? A couple of months, maybe. When they introduced her, she was she sucked at every sport in their vignettes. So, softball, soccer, tennis, golf, pickleball, bocce ball, cheese. I was like, yeah, I get that this is a gimmick and it's a joke practically, but it's not even a joke that fits for what she was. Now, I'm sure no one else that's reading this is going to know that. And for that matter, if they're sending it out to news outlets, they probably will not care. They're just going to be like, oh, wow, hey, great, Coach Campanelli. So, yeah, that, it, it seems like this was, it was work put into this. I, I'm not going to deny that there was work put in this, but it, it was another case of whoever did the work doesn't actually watch this. They just went off of the stuff that they already knew. And then we got Genesis. And they gave her a super villain backstory. Well, left alone in the outback of Australia and dusty red roads. And she only her only friends were knives and nunchucks. Okay. So why don't you just leave and put on an outfit and go start crime, for instance? I mean, that, that's what this sounds like. Sounds like it's just a backstory to a supervillain. Though she was lonesome and forgotten, she never gave up. Yeah, come on. So, yeah, that is what it is. That's, that's the uh, press release for that. I will uh, make sure that I try to put that on the pages as well. But, yeah, seriously, guys, y'all could have did a better job with this poster. You could have hired any number of creative graphic designers to do something better than that. But, you know, what can I say? I mean, I could have did this poster. Seriously, I, I, I could le have legitimately done this poster. And I'm no graphic designer. Just give me the P PNG files for all the, the wrestlers that WoW has. And let me put it on the backdrop on Photoshop and I'm done. This is lazy. Or at least they didn't put a lot of effort into trying to make it look good. Or look spectacular. And the only reason I'm giving them crap about that is solely because of I've seen other rustic promotions do this. And do it better. Independent promotions. Promotions that don't have the money. And they found somebody to, to make it. So it just comes off to me as a little disappointing. It's like, seriously, y'all got y'all. You have a budget, and this is the best poster you could come up with. And you know, if they print them out and people sign them, then that's great. But you know, okay. All right. So moving on. One other thing to talk about before we go any further. Oh, you know, I forgot to mention the news. Uh, Kelsey Heather, you remember her, don't you? The former Randy Rara is now the new Shine Nova champion. Congratulations to her. I'm sure that title will fit nicely on her resume, uh, more so than others. Uh, <clears throat> every so often, I will jump on the WoW's social media and, and see what people are saying about the, the shows, which is how I came to the conclusion that WoW as a promotion if i want to call it that probably should not list themselves or go solely off of what people online are saying on their their uh their page i mean it's it's a lot of nice stuff but i one of the things i kind of know is that whoever it is that the video happens to be about whoever 
the commentators just largely kissed her ass. That's mostly what happens. Like, you'll get her, Coach Campanelli, and then you look at next video. Air your sky, you're the greatest. Next video, ice cold, you should have won. You know, it's a lot of that. Which is why I said, you know, some of that, yes, I'm sure it's legitimate. I'm sure they feel that way, but it can also give you a false read on how good or bad your product is. If you're just going off of, well, this, they said it's good, so it's all, this is all great. Um, <clears throat> But there was two things that <laughs> that caught my attention that I just had to speak on, because very rarely do I, I interact or talk to them. One is... I don't know why this particular phrase was used. Oh, I remember. Um, somebody <laughs> made a post or a comment on a post about the all American girls. And I will not mention that guy's name because I, you know, I didn't interact with him personally. <clears throat> but his post was Americana is a weak character. And of course, while superheroes decide to respond and it was like, she's got more gumption than most. I was like, who is writing this? Some 80-year-old panhandler looking for gold? What gumption? What did you... Who is handling this social media of all the terms? I mean, I don't know why that, that just stuck out to me. Gumption. That's the best defense that you have for Americana is that she has gumption? Gumption. That's just this weird word. <laughs> That was it. Not she has guts. She's she's getting better every day. She's got gumption. And in fairness, his response was simply please. And I, I had to give him a little laugh emoji for that because I thought that I, I did think that was funny. Um, I did respond to him and like, hey, look, I, I get it. She's, but she's she's got some growing to do. And and unfortunately, it's not her fault that she's in the position that she's in because I'm pretty sure somebody there is probably telling her, you're doing just fine, kid. <laughs> There's no need for you to try to get better or go anyplace else. You're doing great. Uh, and the one that I really had to say something about, I, I didn't say much, but I had to say something. Somebody did another post and I guess it would be considered somewhat negatively I, his comment was and again I will not mention his name does anyone watch this show that was his simple comment and the response that whomever it is that's on their social media gave was it's, we're the third most watched wrestling show on TV. And I, not trying to be mean, I had to say you're the seventh. And now I'm going to explain that. And by the way, if you, the, uh, the post about gumption is on the All American Girls post on Facebook and uh, on Wild Superheroes post of the All-American Girls for July 4th. The other one is the uh, Aero Sky responding to Coach Campanelli. So if you want to see it, you can go ahead and see it. But uh, yeah, we're the third most watched wrestling show on TV. So now, there are qualifiers to that statement. First off, it's not true. And I, I hate to say it, to put it that bluntly, but it's not true. It's the, 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 wow is not the third most watched wrestling program on TV. That is, I don't even know why that came out of his mouth. Or whoever's mouth. Wow, at best, and I don't have the stats in front of me, but at best would be the seventh most watched wrestling program on TV. Because they didn't now keep in mind, they didn't say brand, they said watch wrestling show. So that is going to place you in, in line of Raw, SmackDown, and NXT. Then following that, that's going to place you in line of Dynamite. Collision, Rampage. Those are six different shows by the major players. Now, Collision. Did I say Collision? Yeah, okay. <laughs> I think I said Raw again, but uh, Dynamite, Rampage, Collision. Collision is questionable because they don't get high ratings just in general. But they do 
nominally speaking, about the same level as WoW. When I was looking at the <clears throat> the emails, the stats, and the ratings, the viewership data, WoW basically hovers or hovered right around where TNA Wrestling was. And again, now there's qualifiers on that. There's qualifiers on them being the most, I'm not even going to say the third most watched. There's qualifiers on them being the seventh. They have more outlets than TNA. I mentioned it earlier. I said something wasn't the apples to apples comparison. This isn't an apples to apples comparison. First off, they shouldn't be comparing themselves to WWE or AEW. And any one of their shows, as much as I say that AEW has been tanking lately, in my opinion, they still have a relatively loyal fan base that exceeds about 400,000 viewers on the average. Whereas while last I checked was about a quarter million, 250,000. They've gone under that, they've gone over that, but that's basically the hover mark. Last I checked. So unless, you know, if WoW management is getting the data and they're seeing anything and, and that, if that's the bar that they're trying to go for, then hey, bravo to them. But no, let's not let's not play with words. Let's not try to paint the picture to be the, oh, well, you know, we're third most. I mean, yes, we'll be sufficient. Yes, people watch the show, you know, give us give us a chance, watch it, you know. I invite you to watch to see and phrase it. Get somebody that's that will phrase those things appropriately, where it's not something debatable. It's the same thing I said about when they make comments on the show. It's like don't don't use things that are easily disputable. And that's an easily disputable thing. It's like we don't want to be associated with wrestling up until we need to be associated with wrestling. It's kind of like the same thing that they did a couple of years ago when they didn't have any TV and they were trying to get buzz. They went to Russell Cade. They probably ain't thought about Russell Cade since then because they, that's not an audience that they generally aim for. So, no. <laughs> the end result of all that is no. This is not a... Uh, the third most watched wrestling ride. And I really doubt that they're the seventh, quite honestly. Especially at this point with TNA's picking up steam. I mean, because we don't have the data on um, all their viewerships. I know their Vice viewerships are crap. I know some people watch it. Because <laughs> somebody did say, yeah, I'll look at it at midnight on, on Vice. But yeah, look, Vice, the, the errors on there was like awful. And that was a year ago. I don't know how what it's doing now, but first off, it's coming on late in the night. Secondly, the last time that I saw the ratings for any airing of WoW, any airing of WoW, I'm talking about months worth of data before they cut off. Because and that's another thing. Russell Nomics doesn't even view that as an important enough thing to bother with the data. They just cut it off in general. And every other place it looks like it's a, a task to try to find it. I, but the data for them on Vice at its highest I saw was like 5,000 viewers. 5,000 viewers across the country. That was what it was the data was looking at. That ain't good. Even in a midnight spot, that's not good. They should have they, they should have probably been on earlier or something like that. Or maybe, just maybe, here's a crazy idea. Maybe if they advertised it every once in a while, somebody might tune into it. Maybe if they put a lower third on the show that says, watch WoW on these locations. Check his local listens for syndication. Go on Vice. It may be if they put a little 30-second spot in the program that said that. But what do I know? So that seems to be 
most of what's going on. Oh, and I forget that they're getting ready to do new tapings. WoW is getting ready to begin their next set of tapings. So for those of you who are near in and around or willing to travel to Glendale, California, which apparently is about 25, 30 minutes, depending on traffic from what I understand, <clears throat> between Los Angeles to Glendale, you too can go and get tickets and watch the tapings of WoW in their new location at the, what did I have down here? East End Studios. So they are moving from the Belasco to East End Studios, which is basically the same thing that WCW did back in the day. I got no problem with them going to the studio. I just hope that they are able to... The look has never been a problem. I shouldn't even, I'm not even going to say anything about it. I, I hope that they're able to make some sense of their programming. That's what I hope. I hope that they're able to do that. But one thing I will also say is that I don't know if I would be buying no tickets to go to WoW after I looked them up. Like, general admission tickets are $60. Are you kidding me? 60 bucks to, to go to see WoW? Now, granted, it's hours worth of stuff, but $60. Now, again, that you know that might just be the economics of California. Because everything is more expensive there opposed to here. So, that might just be a norm. But general admission for most wrestling shows that we would attend on this end of the world, general admission, maybe 30 Like half of that. That's just... Paying them and, and some wrestling plays, depending on where the building is, is cheaper than that. But the last thing is their VIP package. They got it for one night only. So if you let me get the dates first off. August 2nd, 3rd, 8th, 9th, 16th, 17th, 23rd, and 24th are all available for general admission at $60 a pop. The doors will open at 4.30 p.m. and the matches start at 5 and it will run to 10 p.m. So you got five hours worth of matches in front of you, which means that you're going to get months worth of TV if you're doing that over and over and over again. The VIP package that they have, which is listed for one night only, that is on the last night, that's August 24th. <clears throat> uh, the packages include meet and greet, autograph, and photo opportunity with Wild Superhero on-site VIP concierge, opportunity to walk down the WoW entrance aisle just like your favorite WoW superhero. Okay. Premium ringside seat within the first five rows, framed WoW superhero autograph, 8x10 photo, WoW drawstring bag with the WoW T cap and surprise inside. No outside items can be brought in to the WoW experience. VIP early entry doors open at 415, matches at 5, yada, 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 yada. That costs $175. Now, lastly, I had Lord Jack. You guys remember Lord Jack? He was one of the attendees at WOW, and he was kind enough to provide some, some information on what was going on and how WOW was progressing, so on and so forth. In fact, I think last we had spoke, he said he was about three months ahead of everything that we were seeing at the moment. Uh, he gave me a rundown. He paid for uh, VIP in one particular instance. He gave me a rundown of what he got. And I'm sure that I read that through at, um, at some point. But the end result was it, it didn't seem to be worth the uh, the money, at least not to him. He didn't feel like for the money that he paid, he got necessarily what he, um, what he should have got. And I'm going to go back to that email just so I can read through some of that. Um. Boo. Okay, here's part of it. It might be a relevant point to point out that I paid the rather eye-watering price of $235 for the VIP the first night and found it barely worth it. Surely there's no point in doing it more than once. 
Being VIP got me soda plus water plus snacks, a tote bag, a drawstring bag, a shirt, a hat, and a wrestler's promo pick. They also had a meet and greet with a couple of wrestlers, but there's no order, schedule posted, or anything to alert you to the fact that the wrestler was in the room for that element. I saw Keita Rush, Americana, and Jungle Girl in the meet and greet area when I went by. There were only 30 or so folk in the VIP each night. VIP are on the balcony overlooking the ring, though I was only up there for a couple of episodes and spent most of the night at ringside. <clears throat> So the merch area had various apparel effectively was on their Amazon store and headshots of some wrestlers. I lamented that they didn't have stickers as I don't wear t-shirts and I found me a couple on the second night. Ironically, some of the wrestlers promo pictures of girls that are no longer with the company. I specifically remember Razor of the Heavy Metal Sisters was on offer of one of the headshots. The only one that came assigned was Samantha Smart. I don't remember the Thunderclappers being there, though I may have simply not noticed. Okay, yeah, he's, he was responding because I was asked, do they give those things out? <laughs> I, was, I was like, everybody's got Thunderclappers there, and it seems like it's the only merchandise that anybody ever gets. So I was like, do they just hand those things out? So, yeah, that that was uh, what I was figuring with that. But he he was not aware of it and couldn't really comment on it. Wow. Okay. So, yeah, I do it past the news okay fast, pretty fast, but I spent a lot of time on WoW just in general. But that's, you know, part of the show. So, as uh, I normally do, I'm going to take this moment to give myself and you a break. And when we come back, it'll be the full review of WoW Women of Wrestling episode Twin Turmoil. And we're back. So, the slate for this show. Wow. Episode 243. That is the seasonal count. The chronological count is episode 95. They are almost at 100 episodes. The air date, July 6. The title, Twin Turmoil. Uh, the show started off with a recap of the Fabulous Four versus the Island Dynasty with the Beast from four weeks prior. This this is stuff from episode 239. But this was largely there to set up the match with Penelope Pink and Tiki Chamorro. This implies a feud of some sort. I, um, I didn't mind the video package to set up the match. But I also didn't think that the video package really set up the match like the island dynasty and the beast won pretty decisively so i don't know what tiki tomorrow was you know what this match was for didn't seem like it was an ongoing feud this seems more like the start of a new feud right back to where they were although i'm pretty sure that this thing will be abandoned because how can they keep it going unless they're just going to stick it with tiki as the last one standing. <clears throat> I could probably get some mileage out of that, actually. Now that I just said that out loud. But anyway. The commentators are shown on screen. David McClain. And this is why I said I'll get back to him. David McClain continues to chew up the scene. And he's getting, like, more animated than he had been before. This is my partner, Nigel. You know, stuff like that. He, he is very... Loud. <laughs> I don't mean in the literal sense, but like I said, he 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 chews up the scene. And that's what some people term it when you get some somebody in a in a that's acting, but they're overacting. Yeah, that. Um, it's also not a great shot, in my opinion. Uh, not that they didn't cover it, but I know what they're trying to do. I know what. Whoever's running that is attempting to do. They're trying to make sure that they keep the WoW logo fully in the shot when they go to the commentator table. Now, I'm not saying that it happens specifically right then, but they do it quite a bit. They make sure, and it, 
It's like for me, is Dead Space. That that's my production eye. It is it's a Dead Space shot. Is yes, it's the logo back there, but. Anybody that's watching that show is going to know they're watching WoW. Anybody that's watching that show will see the logo in a moment. Anybody watching that show probably will see the logo when you know either in the lower third or when they go back to the ring. And they just got the big WoW neon sign behind them, or at least the neon virtual neon sign behind them on the board. So I don't view that as necessary for them to place the shot to where. Nigel and David are in the lower, they aren't the lower third, but if we were breaking it off into fourth, they're they're almost like the lower half of the screen. When they could be taking up the screen. Anyway, that's that's not a hint of that. That, That's a personal opinion. Um so the first thing, the first match that we get is uh Penelope Pink. And Tiki tomorrow. So, Lana Star, Vicky Lynn, and uh, Penelope Pink come out the ringside. I don't know why I just blanked on Pink's name. And the first thing that they do is the same goddamn thing they do every time a heel comes out there is they cut a promo and then they turn it towards David McClain. How many times do we have to do this? How many? And it was so annoying this time. This time it was like super annoying. And I know some people like, yeah, he made the right, but okay, let's let's look at some of the logic of these this situation. So we get David, and we'll again we'll get into that. She kicks it off with opening promo. She starts talking to David Klein as always. And essentially, now, Lana has grown into, I don't know if it's been written out for, and I don't know if she's just doing it off the cuff. Lana delivers very well for who Lana Starr is and her personality and how she, her persona, how she projects and everything. Much better than I thought that she would. If you'd asked me this like a year ago, I'd be like, yeah, she'd never get it done. No, she's actually, she's growing into it. Now, I don't know, again, I don't know if she can do this on the fly. I don't know if she needs to have bullet points. I don't know if she's memorized something like, okay, this is what I'm going to say and this, that, and the other. But her delivery is good. I can at least give that. Uh. She starts talking about basically our heel ch- former champion Penelope Pink. In so many words, is too good for this match. I mean that that's essentially what it came down to, and, and I was I'm good with that. I like that. I like that Lana Star puts her charge, her client, whatever you want to call her, over. The former wild champion should and basically should not be in the ring with, with this person, the, the smallest member of the island dynasty and all that stuff like that. And she's holding this conversation with David, and David's like, well, she earned this, this match. And my notes here was how and when, because I don't remember that. When, is she, when and how did she earn this match? This is the stuff that bothers me. And it just randomly mentions stuff, and it's like, what, what, when, how? I don't remember. I don't think I saw that at all. What? This, I mean, it, it's not like they say whoever wins the Island Dynasty match is going to get a shot at Penelope Pink, and why would that be a thing? She's not the champion. So what? What is there to earn to get a shot at Penelope Pink? All due respect to Penelope Pink, she does not have anything that would be worth trying to earn to get. So I didn't understand the comment, nor did I understand him saying that she had earned it already. And in the scenario that I just gave, Tiki didn't even win the match, the Beast won. So when was this? How was this? Ah. Fortunately, that might have been the worst part of the segment. Just the interaction with David McClain, that right there might have been the worst part of the segment. And I'm and I'm pleased to say, 
Tiki and Penelope Pink were entertaining. And I don't want to get my hopes up on Tiki. I, I, I don't, I don't want to get my hopes up on her. I don't want Tiki to break my heart. Because I could get behind the evolution of Tiki tomorrow. I can get behind her being the, the resident underdog that's trying to fight to get to the top of, of wow, whatever the case may be. But I, I, I just have lost faith that they would be able to do anything smart with her. Although, although, to be completely fair, this is maybe the best presentation of Tiki Tomorrow that I've seen. Both in the ring and her participation at the end of the episode. I, I think that she deserves that. That's why I was like, I, I really, truly hope that they do something with her. If, they, if they're starting her off on this path, I hope they do something with her. So when the match starts out, I mean, uh, it's fairly easy to see that Penelope Pink is, is treating this light, which I thought was a good job by her because Tiki cannot just come out beating people up when she's been on the other side of the winning spectrum, let's say, for you know the bulk of her time in a while. It's not as bad as Foxy Pierce or Pep Riley and stuff like that, but she, you know she wasn't a world beater either. She's like middle of the middle of the road. And Pink starts off; she gets arm bar. She's pushing her head down and scruffing her hair. I was like, okay, and it's telling the story. This is the things that I've been wanting. Pink was telling the story of how. Much I care about this person. I don't care about her at all. And then tomorrow got the chance to kind of outmaneuver Pink on a few occasions, which gave her a, um, not an edge, but it leveled the playing field. So I thought those things were fine. Pink was able to make her comeback. And she did a comeback without having to cheat. Which again, good stuff. And she poses and she walks around and she's parading for the fans and everything. She's taking Tiki lightly. And again, I thought, okay, because it makes sense. The promo that Lana, if you exclude talking to David McLean, the promo that Lana Starr made sense also. There's like none of them are taking her seriously. She is looked at as the weak link. This is Tiki trying to prove differently. So we move on, and, you know, it's, it's a very um, wild-paced match. We'll just call it that because they, no one really moves super fast in a while. But it was a very wild-paced match, and Tiki it was able to get some good stuff in there, hit a really good drop kick. I wouldn't be surprised if Pink legitimately had the air knocked out of her with that one. I mean, because it seemed like it had some, some, uh, some good connection there, right, right in the stomach. And we get Pink, and again, she takes back control at some point, and she starts beating up on Tiki, right? Tiki, let, let's fast forward towards when she gets the advantage again. At some point in the match, Tamaro comes off. It's not a um, beautiful disaster because she it's like a modified version of it. She comes off with the uh, head, but opposed to the kick, which sends Penelope Pink into the ropes. She falls into the second ropes. And then Tiki calls out and does the 6 7 1. And she nailed her with the thing. Now, now you got Lana Stark concerned. She gets up on the apron. She starts talking to the referee. Vicky Lynn comes up. She hooks uh, Tamara in a full Nelson. Somehow, Tiki was able to get out. Pink nails uh, Vicky Lynn, and 
she's like, whoops, oh, my, I, I hit my partner, I hit my friend. And then Tiki comes up behind Pink, rolls her up, very good roll up. I mean, it didn't didn't look like there was a lot of wriggle room for, for Penelope Pink in there at all. And that was it. She was done. She, she, she lost the match. But I, I wish they didn't have this thing where people were just kind of sitting at the curtain waiting to come in there. But that that's what this was. They were waiting at the curtain. And Miami Sweet Heat comes charging in, and they start beating up on Tiki tomorrow because she just won the match. All right? So when that happens, the fat, well, like I said, the Fab Four attack immediately after, like within seconds, they attack. But that's uh, broken up by the Island Dynasty. And somehow the three of them are able to hold off the four, and then Wild goes off in mid, you know, goes to break mid fight. The next segment David McLean is in the ring. To interview the Island Dynasty or what's left of the Island Dynasty. This is the only problem that I had with Tiki in the night. Her promo was dry. It was it, it, it had no oomph. It had no emotion. Didn't even sound like she was emotionless because she was tired. It just sounded like she just didn't have any any emotion to give. So David comes in there and he does the, you know, the interview thing, you know, because he has to do that. <clears throat> and she responds for, for whatever thing he set up for her, and she gives a, a nice dry response. David then goes on and shows that he has the ability to ban whoever he wants, whenever he wants. And my note was, why now and not not other times? Which essentially sets up the main event, which they, you know. We we know what this is going for, and then and it's tonight is going to be the Miami Sweet Heat versus the Twins versus Twins again. Yeah, and I'm sorry. It's only because it's so disappointing. But I understood that he was trying to create some sort of stipulation that people could get excited over. And we're going to have a main event. We're going to have the Tonga Twins facing Miami Sweet Heat in the main event for whatever. And all of the Fabulous Four members will be banned from ringside. Now, my note there was, didn't they have this stipulation before? How is this new or interesting? Never mind the fact that they had several matches where Lana Starr and the rest of the Fabulous Four didn't even bother to show up. So, so why is it a thing now? That was my issue. And I also really wish somebody else would be the in-ring interviewer instead of him. But you know, I digress. And, you know, matter of fact, while I am digressing, let's just go ahead and mention some of the other stuff with, with that has begun to happen because of him. And I'm sure Dan McClain is not intending to do this, but he's doing it, and he needs to recognize he's doing it. I said when Stephen Dickey was on the show still as a commentator, he might be backstage for all I know, but when he was there, my only real criticism of him is that he is slowly morphing into David McClain. He's starting to adapt David's voice. He's not saying anything any different. He doesn't provide a different viewpoint. He, you know, he was essentially becoming an extension of David's personality. That's, what, that's another thing that I mean when I say David is chewing up the scene and he becomes overbearing because they just become him. And now it's starting to happen to Nigel. When he first got there, I was like, oh, wow, okay, Nigel's a breath of fresh air because he provided something different. Nothing against Stephen Dickey, but like I said, Dickey was falling down the path of becoming David McClain 2.0. Now Nigel's becoming that. Doing the David McClain stuff, saying the David McClain lines. So like, it's, it's just starting, but I was like, this is not going to end well. 
hold on, David, we got to take a pause for the cause. I was like, God damn, that's a David McLean line. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Nigel, if you are listening, I know we have been in the same building together, even though I did not know we were in the same building together. So I'm going to say this to you as, as a commentator, one to the other. Don't start adopting David's stuff. Please keep your own voice. A disagreement with how someone's presented every once in a while isn't bad. Doesn't have to be an argument, and you don't have to take the side of the heel, but you can point out something that doesn't exist. <clears throat> point out something that he doesn't see, or whatever the case may be. But to just completely start to morph into David, which is what I feel is happening, is not going to help that show. He has largely, he being Dave McClain, largely overshadowed and sat on top of the commentating booth for years and it doesn't change it is time for them to get a change in there the one female voice that they had i don't want to say he ran off but she certainly didn't feel the need to stay she didn't give anything she didn't provide anything why would she stay david talks over everybody it would have been a far better product if they had, let's just say Nigel Zane and, and uh, Mendez was still, if she was still there, it would have provided something different and it would have given David a different position to take, which was the other thing that I was upset about because, like I said in the note, he shows that he has the ability to do whatever he wants, whenever he wants, but he's sitting at ringside constantly allowing things to happen on a week-to-week -week basis up until he just decides, for whatever reason, that, oh, well, now I have to extend the rules. One or two things should happen in terms of him being there. Now, I realize, I know, I understand that none of this is ever going to happen because he's not going to take himself off TV, and it was very evident in this episode, he is not going to get off of TV doing what he's doing. He enjoys that too much. It's almost like if you told me that he was financing the WoW, if there was no Gene DeBuzz, if you said that he was financing WoW, somebody backstage is like, yeah, just put him on TV so it can make him happy, I would absolutely believe you. Because there are times when he just, I don't like using the term money mark, but he, there are times when he behaves like a money mark. Which is also what Jeannie Buss behaves like, like a money mark. Because that, that whole, I forgot to mention earlier, that whole panel just comes off to me like a just gigantic vanity project. If there was ever a point where I was like, you know, I feel justified in feeling like, why wow, was Jeannie Buss's vanity project? This is it. You notice, and I'm roping back around to that thing. You notice when I read all of that stuff out that they were going to do, very little of that had anything to do with wrestling. It was, we're going to talk about the rise of female representation and professional sports, the influence of comics on pro wrestling. In the preview of season three, very little of that has anything to do with, hey, what's going on here? With the stuff that you get at other wrestling conventions, none of that. And the preview of season three, what are we, we're going to show a couple of clips of it already. It takes it out of being a rusting promotion and makes it just a TV show. And that's basically what WoW is, just a TV show. So, uh, um, yeah, and look, if there's getting back to the point, there's one or two things that I think that he should do, regardless of the fact that I know he's not going to do it. The first option is just to remove himself from the booth, which, again, that ain't happening. But if he did remove himself from the booth and they assigned a new commentator, probably in this case, preferably female, that can be the athlete, so to speak, that can speak on how 
this works and how bad that hurt. And, Ooh, I've been in that situation before, whatever. Like I, I thought Vicky Lynn was a very good heel announcer, but we, that's not going to happen. But the point being is another voice to work with Nigel opposed to David McClain. What that would do, taking him out of there, is that it at least give the ability for the heels to do something and not be doing it in front of the owner of the company who could do stuff at any given time or insert rules at any given time. It, it would increase the level of plausibility that they can get away with stuff because he would only need to show up when there's something major. You make an announcement, say, hey, look, the referees are in charge. Assign a head referee. And when you have a situation that is too big for the refs and subsequently too big for the head referee, then David McClain comes out. And you might get yourself a good pop. They might be happy to see when he comes in and lays down the law. Because if it only happens every so often, it would be something that, you know, could be looked forward to. That is the first suggestion, or the first option. The second option is this. If he doesn't want to remove himself, assign someone to be like the general manager so that he isn't the guy that's doing it. Say something along the lines of, you know, being out here as the commentator and then as an as a interviewer, it, it, there is a conflict of interest. And legitimately, there is. Like, seriously. What other sport does that? But the owner is going to be doing like, a, well, time to put on my commentator hat. Time to take that off. Put on my general manager hat. Time to take that off. Put on the interview hat. No one does that. So... He can have a little moment on the show, give a minute and a half or something like that, and a lot the time where he can sit in front of a camera and say, <clears throat> due to the conflict of interest of me being the commentator on this program, I cannot justifiably and unbiasedly make rulings on wrestlers while I'm watching them do this. So, I have assigned a general manager to take care of these things when I, you know, you know, when we're airing. So as the show is airing, I don't have that power anymore. I've officially forwarded it over to someone else. After the show, yes, I still have whatever, still in charge, still sign contracts, this, that, and the other. But during the show, when something needs to be handled, so and so handled. And I, and my personal nomination for that would be Erica Porter, Jungle Girl. She's there, or she at least she pops up every once in a while. And if she's going to pop up every once in a while, pop up for something useful. Pop up for something that they can get something out of her with. Have her show up there, be the general manager, and lay down the law. Those are just the suggestions, which I know they will never do. Uh, okay, so where was I? Uh, next segment. Uh, and then the other thing, the note. What was the segment for? Dave McClain in the room, in the ring for this. I'm like, what? Well, what was the segment for? And then and, and that'll be addressed in a second. Also, it's like everything leads to the to the next thing. Next segment, and Zantara's gonna love this one because she feels like I'm I've turned into Jay Boogie's number one fan, which I am far from. But um. Is Lil J Boogie versus Ice Cold. Yeah. So let's get this over with. So Lil J Boogie. And <laughs> here's a, a, a interesting thing. Like it's on their own page on the YouTube channel. Because they list J Boogie on the uh on the show on the clip it also pulls up like two other jay boogies that have nothing to do <laughs> do with wow they got jay boogie a dj and a music producer and then they got jay boogie nigerian media personality this is one of the things that's like you know some of the names y'all may need to think some of these like candy crush and sierra breeze jay boogies like i could just find the people that already have names i mean look i 
I know some of that's unavoidable, but like even the wow is kind of difficult. Even though they came up with it first, I got to give them credit. Even though they came up with it first, as far as I can remember, now I got to go back and look at when uh, World of Warcraft came out. The point being is that if you Google WoW, that's probably what you're going to get. You're going to get World of Warcraft, not WoW Wrestling, unless you specify WoW Wrestling. And even then, you might still get World of Warcraft. So this match, Ice Cold versus Lil J Boogie. Uh, Ice Cold looks better. I... I was growing to like Ice Cold when she was part of Exile, but now she just seems like a rudderless ship, just lost at sea, nowhere to go, nothing to do, no destination in sight, and no goal to obtain. She doesn't speak, doesn't know her personality, they don't do anything to build up her personality, nothing. She's just another face amongst a bunch of faces. Jay Boogie is only slightly better than that and that they talk her up and she comes out and she does her dance numbers and all that good stuff. And then we get into the match. Uh, Somewhere in here, when the match starts, uh, Dave McClain starts talking about Ice Cold's um, background. And I also need to point out, there used to be like a, a strong tell of anybody that was trained by WoW in previous years. Oddly enough, when I said that tell in one podcast somewhere, like <laughs> I never saw it again. But you get to tell somebody who was trained by WoW in the first couple of years of it. I'm talking about going back in early 2001 and all that. They would do almost the same sequence per match. It would be tie up, headlock, crank down three times, stomping the foot while they do shoot off tackle. That was almost everybody. It's like they didn't know how to do another match. Now the tell for a while is the is the fighting stance. If you see people who are basically trained in a while, that, that seems to be one of the things, the fighting stance. Let's, let me put my hands up into boxing motion and then circle and then lock up. That seems to be what the, the new thing for them happens to be. Now... Ice Cold has subtle facial features that I like. While they were standing in the ring, she was standing there sizing uh, her up. And I thought that was, you know, is a subtle thing, but nice of her to do. Boogie and Ice Cold had a fair match. And that's hard for me to say, but they had a fair match. Although... For the most part, it seemed like a pretty basic and slow match, but now you could you could attribute some of that to maybe Ice Cold being methodical if you if you wanted to really sell the idea of well the match is that pace because of XYZ. Like she would be a good reason to, to put uh to put that blame on or or <laughs> whatever you however you want to phrase it. She applied a really nice hammerlock on the on the mat to uh, Boogie. Boogie rolls out of it, gets her in the head scissors. So there was a nice exchange between the two. I'm not gonna go through the entirety of the match because I'm I, I'm still I'm sorry I'm still not a J Boogie fan. I'm just not. <laughs> she just, she hasn't. She hasn't done it for me yet. She's gotten better. I, I'll, I'll say that. She's gotten better, but she she hasn't done it for me yet because she, she still comes off to me as everything that the television cartoony side of WoW represents. You are a gimmick, and that's about as far as it goes. 
And if whatever you need to know about that person, if you don't see it in the outfit, then you're probably not going to see it. And that's what Jay Boogie feels like to me. It's like outside of the fact that she dances, it's like what else is she? She didn't, She's another person. She didn't cut any promo. She hasn't expressed her reasons for being there. They did a vignette, but they showed that months late. She's a surface level character like everybody else on there is a surface level character. She does a nice move to Ice Cold in the middle of the match. She does a hip toss. And then she decides that now is a good time to go ahead and start dancing. And that's probably the, the, the nicest version of a dance that she's done on the show. Unfortunately, that, that's one of the problems with her being there. Wow. Like, she is a legitimate dancer. I, I've said before that I've looked up her stuff. I was like, okay, let me, let me check and see if, if she's really a dancer. And yes, she is. And the stuff that I saw was good. The problem is, is that, as stated before in earlier podcasts, WoW and WoW's competitors have an uphill battle. Because people are looking for them to be less than. And she doesn't help it. Because the first couple of times when she came out there, the, the dance did not seem to go smoothly. And so it just got labeled as, you know, maybe she's not as good as dance as she thought or whatever the case may be. But that's, that's, wow. Things like that happen. So even now when she danced well, it didn't, you know, it was all the wrong time. It's not like it, not like it popped the crowd. It's not like it uh, was meaningful in any way. You know, Look at the other wrestlers that you've seen out there when they do things like that. It usually is a moment where they have built the audience, built the audience, built the audience, and then they give them that, whatever their thing happens to be. This was just a dance number out of nowhere because she did one good move, and it's like, all right, so it's time to pop lock and do all that good stuff. And then like an idiot, I'm going to walk up to you, you know, like I'm not paying attention. And good or nice cold, I don't, I don't know if that was already pre-planned, but she at least looked like she attacked with some veracity. And I was happy with that. Although it didn't make any difference because ultimately Jay Boogie won. She wins with her leg lariat. Which I will say, and you know, I try to be as fair on what I see as I can. The leg lariat does look good. I am not still sold on her as a complete wrestler, but the leg lariat does look good. Jay Boogie does come off to me like she's their uh, means of keeping Jeannie Buzz happy. The stick you in Laker colors. I don't know if I'm reading too far into that, but, you know, just so happens that the owner of, the, of WoW happens to have the Lakers. So make of that what you will. So Jay Boogie wins the match with her leg lariat. I thought that it was a fairly basic match. Neither have a personality to care about, but it was okay. Ice Cold is still being defined by being formerly in exile. Where is her promo? Where is she going to explain what she's doing and where she's going and what she's intending to do since exile is broken up or she got kicked out or she quit or whatever reasons that they have? I don't know. This seems like it was to push J Boogie. I wrote this was to push J Boogie dot, 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 I guess. Because I don't know. I can I can never tell with WoW what it is that they're trying to do. Next match, Animal Instinct, or next segment is, is the match, Animal Instinct versus Team Spirit. Now, I've walked into this already saying I do not care about this match. You have two teams walking ahead that are absolute loser teams. And the only plus that you get out of a situation like that is that one of them has to win. 
And I figured between the two of them, it's going to be Animal Instinct. And guess who won? Animal Instinct. Now, Goldie Collins starts off with a promo. And she, much like Lana Starr, whether it's written or not, whether she did it off the cuff or whether they prepped her before she walked out there, she delivered well. It's another character-driven promo. It got to include something about pups and, you know, things like that. She passes the mic off, and then Katarina Jinx starts her dialogue as well. The one thing I will say about Katarina is that she sounds like every feline cartoon character that I've ever known from back in the day. I mean, let me put on the deepest most feline cat voice that I can possibly do. My gosh. And I'm sure if I, ins- if I remember, if I insert some like old Catwoman things from like the 1970s Batman cartoon, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. It's like everybody talks. To- Every female that has ever had any sort of cat gimmick in a cartoon all sound like that. <sighs> they look like they're playing the part. That's, that's pretty much what it comes down to. They they still look like they're playing the part. I'm not, not sold on them yet. And not for nothing, I've seen a lot of comments about um, Hunkley's dress. It's like, why don't she change? And I just want to sidebar to say, okay, look, give her a break. You know, <laughs> they, they shoot this all in the week. She probably wore that thing. A couple of days in a row, which which on TV stretches out for months. So, you know, it is what it is. I, I care a lot less about her dress than how she performs. She does the ring announcement well. I just wish she'd stop trying to incite the crowd into doing one fall. If they're going to do it, they're going to do it. You ain't got to give them a cue for it. That's how it's been in every other wrestling promotion. Why should you be different? So, um, Team Spirit are the opponents in this. I was like, when did they even tag up last? And I listened to the commentators talk about these two. I was like, what are you talking about? They have some revisionist history in this episode because there's like... Zane specifically says they've been doing well. I absolutely lost my mind. Then I was like, when? When did they do well? When did they even pair off lately? Like I just said, when did they even tag up last? How have they been doing well? Same thing with Animal Instinct. Like, well, they're doing so good in the tags. It's like, how are they doing good? They've had like three matches. They lost all three. So I don't know what it's like. What are you talking about? You're losing credibility. <sighs> and they keep carrying on about everybody being impressive. Everybody's impressive. Yet another reason was like you need a different voice in there. Everybody can't be impressive. Every once in a while, you can say, you know what? So and so ain't no good. You need it, but you need it coming from somebody that the, the fans would accept hearing it from. David McClain can't get up there and say, well, you know, Pep Riley really has a terrible win loss record, but a heel commentator could. Because even though he would be telling the truth, likely he or she, I should say, would add on some stuff that would give it fluff and then people would dismiss it. But it's, it's like the Jerry Lawler or the Bobby Ean and the Jesse Ventura or any name any other heel announcer. Yes, they, they can they can give it the, the perspective or the spin of the heel or the opposite side of the of the uh, spectrum. And because it's coming out of their mouth, you don't necessarily have to take it as fact. But it does provide a different outlook. If I was sitting there and heard Zane 
live in front of me like yeah team spirit has been doing well my first comment be what are you smoking and can i have some because if you think they've been doing well then you clearly are on something this team sucks they were two nimrods that got drafted into something that they got beat up for and benched not but a match later lost after that and hadn't been seen since how they've been doing good Anyhow, the team of Animal Instinct stands, you know, they they pretty much tower above these two. And if there's anything that good that came out of here, that the right person took to drop the fall. Because despite the fact that uh, Sasha Sparks is lodged into this team, She's probably the only one of the four that has any aspirations to do wrestling anywhere. And she didn't need to be losing. So she didn't. But anyhow, like I said, both Collins and Jinx are towering above them. And it's another case of the heels taking the baby faces lightly or trying to. One of the things that did not necessarily work all that well in the match was the whole step-up situation that Sparks tried to do with Goldie Collins. Now, she did it, but it it showed that Goldie Collins had to stand there and look while she was doing it and with no ability to stop her whatsoever. Like, the look on his face like, what are you doing? How, the, the, how are you climbing the ropes? So, I wish that hadn't have been a spot there. And if it were, then it probably should have been quicker and smoother. Animal Instinct at some point takes control. Once, of course, once Pep Riley gets into the ring. Uh, I mean, it, it, she got her her little shine spot where she did a little uh, cartwheel into the back elbow and the as Nigel called it, the cheer kick basement drop kick. Now, I wrote down, just simplify the name, just basement drop kick and cheer kick on top of it. It's, it's just too much. So she gets that, and then, uh, of course, Collins kicks out. There's a shove off, there's a duck underneath the clothesline, and then Pep Rod runs into Collins like she ran into a brick wall. Ultimately, this is a squash match. This This match was there to... Get Animal Instinct over. And I would have been perfectly fine with that had this match taken place like two or three weeks ago. Instead of Animal Instinct being immediately thrown into uh, title matches against the mother truckers to lose both of them before they score some kind of a win. So we have this match. It is backwards. It should have been ahead of any championship match that they got. Should have been, but it wasn't. Katarina Jinx comes in and she's beating up on uh, Pep Riley too. So the person that Goldie Collins and Katarina Jinx are beating up on is the same person that Goldie Collins beat up on and referenced that she had already beaten in the earlier promo. Pep Riley, uh, again, another reason why I'm like, how is Zane saying that, well, they've been looking impressive. How? When did Pep Riley win anything? So we have that. And the execution of the match was fine. Other than the slow climb of the ropes, I thought that, you know, for two people who aren't uh, wrestlers by trade, they did fine. Well, I should say three because I'd have to include Pep Riley in that. But I don't think anybody really was all that concerned with or cared about this particular match. It was just, you know, it was just a match on the show and it just built time. It was a nice way to, to, to make Animal Instinct look good. I just, like I said, I wish this would have happened earlier for them. So by the time that you actually got to a point where they were challenging for the tag team championships, you might have been able to suspend your disbelief if they actually had some wins preceding that. Sparks looked good when she came back in for, you know, the cleanup. Nice set of moves. 
And then they do it all, you know, the smart baby faces do. She tagged out to her loser friend. <laughs> so, even though know, I had things under control, let's just go ahead and get the tag in so, you know, we can finish this thing up. Uh, Collins does sell well. She she has a good facial expression, sells pretty pretty good. I can't tell with Katarina because, you know, face pain, all that stuff. <clears throat> Getting towards the end, uh, Collins uses size and strength, rams Pep Riley into one corner, then she rams it back into the other. Now, I don't know if that was just a mistake that she went to the wrong corner. Looked good regardless of whether it was a mistake or not. She took it right out of the out of the the opposing corner right into uh, her own. The only thing that I felt that was questionable there is again, I don't know if it was a problem, because you would think that Sparks would have like tagged her friend that she got shoved into the corner with. But she didn't. It showed Collins as being superior size and strength. Katarina gets the tag in, runs across, and catches a sleeping uh, Sparks on the outside, knocks her off. They then perform a uh, tandem maneuver, which I'm going to say Collins needs to work on how she delivers that because her foot was in the way when Pep Riley came down on her ankle. If she was probably any heavier, might have broken it <laughs> or at least caused a sprain of some sort. So they hit the, the uh, finish, which... Uh, Nigel calls pause for effect, ha, 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 and they get the match. I It was a um, net breaker, fall away combo slam, or slam combo, however you want to do it. I was fine with it being a squash. The commentators made this difficult. There was no trusted voice in this commentary. As I said, they just started off with some other stuff. And that reminds me, rolling back to the previous match, McLean brought up, everyone knows Ice Cold's a Division I athlete, and she power lift and swam. It's like, when do we know that? Says, who is everyone? When did we get that information that this is something that she does or did? I... <laughs> It's a different thing when there's like everybody knows Goldberg played football. Yeah, because they talked about it ad nauseum. Everyone knows that Brock Lesnar was in the UFC. Yes, because we saw that and they talked about it and he utilized it. I don't recall them bringing up anything about Ice Cold's past beyond when she did that ill-timed vignette that made her look like an absolute baby face, and then they sent her out there as a heel. So I don't know what Dave McClain is talking about. And that goes back to what I was saying. There's no trusted voice in this commentary. They just say stuff. Next segment, Samantha Smart's office. I also put, I guess, question mark, uh, is she a hunter now? Because the first thing I start seeing is taxidermy and animal heads. And, you know, I was like, what? What is happening here? I was like, why would that be the opening shot for me? Samantha Smart in somebody's taxidermy office, or I don't know, or maybe she goes out on the weekends and shoots animals. I, I don't know. She, she also has a, a miniature uh, figurine of herself. I assume three printed somewhere. But I had no idea what this was. Uh, it, it was a lot of animal memorabilia. If not on the walls, there was stuff on the desk. It was like a, a metal bull and, and some other nonsense. So we start off here, and of course, this is uh, shot very cinematically, meaning that they had looked like a single camera shoot that was reset and reset depending on what the shot required. We get a close-up of the phone, and we see the disciplinarian on the on the phone calling in. Or at least that's you know, that's what we're led to believe. Samantha picks up the phone and she starts talking to the disciplinarian. And Smart starts talking about 
everyone is tired of the disciplinarian's outburst. And what outbursts are they talking about? Just as a recap, they leaned into the angle of the disciplinarian having anger issues when they were on um, Access TV, if I am remembering correctly. All right. That easily has to been about three years ago now. And they haven't brought it up since. That, you know, matter of fact, is is longer than that because when they released the report that they weren't going to be with Access TV any longer, well, I shouldn't say they because WOW didn't mention it to anybody, including their talent. Because uh, a lot of them thought they was they're like, well, when we come back on the air, I was like, they they didn't know they was come back on the air. But anyhow, that's beside the point. Um, yeah, 2020, they were reported by wrestling outlets as Access TV has decided to cut ties with Wow. And that's 2020. That's four years, three and a half. If we're gonna go off of you know. Time, time, actual time frame. If we're going to go off what the TV is doing, not just the current year we we're going to the months, that was like three and a half years ago. Three and a half years of them referencing something that most people that's watching this program right now have no concept of and never saw. And it's not like they reintroduced it. It's not like we've seen the disciplinarian show any signs of anger issues or outbursts or anything like that is just another thing that they're like, well, people will be fine. They'll get it. I, I really wish somebody was there that would say, no, you got to build this. Why are you talking about having her in there? Or, and if it's a case that we just need to get rid of her, then just do it angle at the end. It's like, hey, you lost for the last time. I'm tired of this. I carried you as far as I can carry you, and I ain't carrying you anymore. You're fired. And you could have been done. It didn't have to be broken off into some angle with poor acting. And this is not good acting. I'm sorry. I don't care what anybody else has said. Because I know there were some people on there that was like, this is incredible acting. Now, I, I'm pretty sure that this person that... <laughs> That put that on there probably as being a smart ass because the incredible acting. Why hasn't she won an Emmy already? Because the acting was wooden. This would not get a job on anybody's TV. I'm sorry to say that, but it wouldn't. This is bad. This is a bad setup. This is a bad angle. And this is bad acting and bad storytelling. That should be given to whoever decided that this angle is a green light in the back. Bad, 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 bad. So we see, because we have, we haven't seen any outbursts, uh, outbursts by the disciplinarian, but Smart is giving it to her on the phone, like, hey, I'm tired of this. And yes, you're going to wrestle next week, but if you have one more outburst or whatever, then there will be consequences. Again, referencing things that the audience hasn't seen. Cannot take the idea that everybody that might have seen it on Access TV followed them over. So I am assuming that we have to wait and see if she's going to have some sort of outburst On the next match, next episode, whatever. Smart ends this with, if there's something else, then I will be forced to take this person. You know, some some nonsense like that. I didn't. I started to tune out. It didn't even look like an office that she would be in. Now, for a, a company and a show that everything is as surface level as it can possibly be, this seemed like a odd set choice. With having all these taxidermy trophies laying around. Seemed really odd. Other than the fact that they might have got somebody that's like, hey, sure, you can use my office. I 
<laughs> my office is free for y'all time. Don't worry about the animals. Just leave them up there. So, yeah, it was another one of those. Another one of these moments where Wild just put some nonsense together and hope you follow along. And I'm sure the fact that there's five or six people that pop in on their commentating line saying that this is brilliant stuff is all the all the resource they need to be like, see, it's working. So, yeah. Terrible. Let's just call it for what that is. Moving on. The next segment is a recap of Area of Sky and the All-American Girls getting into the match with Top Tier and Sky saving the All-American Girls from the damage of Top Tier. They show Sky's promo and they have basically another recycled angle. I hope they get out of this soon. Why do I need to see another six-person tag or trios match? Sorry. Why do I need to see another one of these? We just did it. Mother Truckers, Ariel Sky. How much more freedom does she need to win? I mean, isn't free free? Isn't she out of this? Why is she stuck in the orbit of Coach Campanelli? I did not and do not like this. Segment after that is top tier cutting the promo. And uh, Coach Campanelli is good at her promo. She, I don't know if she believes in what she's doing. I don't know if, if it's something that she practices in the mirror or whatever the case may be. But <clears throat> she at least, much like Collins, much like Lana Starr, she, she does deliver verbally. Now, I don't know if uh, this is the best that she can do. I, I doubt it. And kind of the same rules apply with um, Campanelli. It's like, I don't know if this is written out. I don't know if she's doing this off the fly, off the cuff. But as stated, same rules apply. She does well. The only thing that I could possibly add to her with that is I... I which she and the others that I have named got the opportunity to do other wrestling promos more frequently so they would be good at working the mic to where people would understand who they are, what their motivations are, why you should love or hate them. Campanella is close to that. But she doesn't give enough, man. And I understand that there's handicaps that WoW essentially puts on people because that this entire angle is just – I'm trying not to curse <laughs> because I don't want to have to dig through my audio to try to find – I already got a couple of them that I got to get. But I, I'm trying not to say anything mean. But this angle is crap. This entire angle with Ariel Sky and, and Top Tier – or Air Sky and Campanelli specifically is crap. And I have a sinking feeling that I am not going to be happy with the end result of this. So anyway, if not for the campiness of all of this, this has been fine. The one thing that, that wow really gets me with that is like, uh, I just said it with the last thing. Who is doing the set design here? You don't have to have a poster of the person that you're talking about standing behind the poster of the, uh, the person talking. What is that for? I don't know, why they, but that just bothers me. Like, I already see them on on, <laughs> on the screen. Candy Crush is standing in front of the Candy Crush poster. Coach Gambinelli is in front of the Coach poster and Glitter is in front of a Glitter poster. Seriously? You can just get one poster with top tier as they are a unit. Why wouldn't you just have one singular poster of the team there if we're trying to show this team unity or whatnot? Why do they have to stand directly in front of the posters of themselves? That, you know, and somebody asked me about that uh, when I was at work and we were watching. And I said, look, it's not the fact that they have the posters in there. It doesn't necessarily fit who they are. That's why I was like, set design 
is important. If they're going to play the part of TV, then go all the way. Don't just half-ass it. Meaning, like it would make sense to me out of a highly super arrogant, egotistical, narcissistic person to have a gigantic poster of themselves behind themselves while they're talking. It might even make sense in this instance for me with top tier if they would just had the collective poster. Or if they were in some other setting, it this just doesn't even look like a locker room, really like that in the hallway or something like that, where they just stuck a table there, put some trophies up, stick these posters on the wall. There you're done. Let's tape. And that's probably what happened now that I'm saying it out loud. So, you know, that it's a minor thing, I will admit. It's a minor thing. It's just one of my personal picadillos, one of my personal pet peeves. But no, I don't I don't like the set design that they do because it's so on the nose. Everything that WoW does is on the nose. It is there it leaves no room for subtlety. We gotta make this so that a five year old could get behind whoever they're getting behind. So there you have it. And some and some trophies that I guess they brought in from home that they got to stick in the background. It's like, why, why is this there? No one even sees these trophies until they walk off the screen. So right, anyway, that's that's not that's neither here nor there. Everything has to be overproduced or dumb. So uh, the final segment and the main event. We had the return of Miami Sweet Heat versus the Tonga Twins, the feud that has carried on through this company from essentially a start to present, and I'm glad that this will be the last time that I have to see it. I didn't mind either team facing off each other against the, in the beginning, and I certainly don't mind either team facing off against other teams, but there is... No rivalry here. It's just a series of matches. A rivalry in wrestling of people who actually have some level of interaction and they have been proven to be, in some regard, a threat to one another, equal to one another, something along those lines. Tag team rivalry, I I pointed out a few of them that did exactly that a few episodes ago. The Usos in the New Day. Everything they did wasn't just match, 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 match. They cut promos on each other. They got people interested in seeing them get into the ring and beat each other senseless. Rock and roll in the Midnight Express. It wasn't just match, 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 match. They had to talk and let people know why I don't like the other team. AMW, America's Most Wanted, and Triple X, same thing. You could probably go down the line of any great rivalry in tag team and or singles wrestling. They've all done it. They've all somehow or another through a promo or an interview segment and not just one where the commentator talks over everybody or talks for them. One way or the other, they got their point across that, okay, this team I don't like, and next time we see them, we're going to beat them into the ground because they're inferior to us, or whatever the case may be. You either heal, say something, lie, or whatever the case may be. Tell them that you're going to cheat. I don't care what you people think. I'm going to cheat because my objective is to end them and get them out of this company or, or to win so I can get more money or whatever the case may be. But none of that ever happens with Miami Sweet or the Tonga Twins. They barely speak about each other. They barely talk at all. So other than the fact that they have had several matches, there is no rivalry here. It's just match after match after match after match after match. The Fabulous Four walk out in full force, ignoring David's ban. I already start losing my crap. I'm trying. I'm gonna keep it clean. <laughs> when I saw that, I was like, I, I I know where this is headed, and I was not wrong. So they ignore his band from early in the show. Like we're banning Vicky Lynn, we're banning Alana Star, we're banning Penelope Pink from ringside, and they absolutely ignore it. And they walk out in full force. 
And he is no, no. You hear him on the, on the commentary. He, of course, it makes him come to ringside. And he comes out and he gets the microphone and he basically just resays the same thing. You, you, and you, you're all banned. And then they just leave. I was like, what was this for? Why did they even come out there if they were just going to turn around? I mean, he. <laughs> I don't want to get flustered over the stupidity of this, but let's look at the logic of this, right? So, at the beginning of the show, you have the match. They come out, they be in the foulest floor, and they jump Tiki, right? They beat her up, which allegedly is what keyed off, well, we got to have a main event, we got to have the Tonga Twins versus Miami Sweet Heat, and then we're going to ban them from ringside. They're not going to be able to come out, right? So... There was no stipulation placed on this. There was no consequence placed on this. And that's fine. But then we come to this. Beginning of the match, they completely ignore him. He comes out and, then he, and he essentially just repeats the same thing. And then they leave. There, now, if there ever was a point to attach a consequence, this would have been it. It would have made sense to say, hey, look, I told y'all to not come out here. You're banned. If you don't leave ringside right now, you're going to be suspended without pay. You're going to be fired. You're going to be something. But as it was, it was just like, leave. They fussed, and then they left. So what was this for? What was this segment for? Why was any of this necessary? Other than to put David in a position where he gets to play along with them. And I have never wanted to say that David was doing stuff to be just to be on camera to participate. I've never wanted to say that because I've seen some people make the comments. If somebody on there does it constantly, it's like Diva McLean. But I, I think, but I think that's his gimmick for whatever reasons. He's he's like a heel guy. I have never wanted to play into the idea that he was just doing this just to like I got to be on TV too. But this is what it felt like. Now, regardless of whether he did it or not, that's what it felt like. I. I have to have a moment and be on television because this was pointless. It was no, it didn't require it. There was no need for this little segment of the show whatsoever. It didn't accomplish a thing. This was a look at me moment for David McClain. Right down to him essentially dancing with the crowd chanting along with him like leave leave and then he starts doing this little dance but like i said what there was nothing that would make them go other than he just said it and they all acted like well (laughs) we got no choice but to go now since he told us to our face this is just, this is absurd. And then he's in there overacting again. Yeah. So they leave without any consequence attached to them. Like I said, you know, it would have been different. And how much effort would that have taken? Seriously, how much effort would it have taken just to, to say, hey, look, we told you to get out. If you don't leave in the next 30 seconds, you're fired. Chew on that. And then be done. If they had to put this in there, if they if they just absolutely had to have it, the least they could have did was apply some sort of consequence. Wow is a universe that exists without consequence. No one wants to be overly mean to anybody. It has to be about all positivity. I wonder if Jeannie Buss even watches this show. Just as a side note, I, I wonder does she even pay a lick of attention to anything other than this, other besides the fact that I own it and it's a nice toy for me to have and I can preach about positivity and women's sports. She probably would have done better for herself if she had bought an NBA, a WNBA team. Just get ownership of the Sparks and do that. Aside from that, I don't see what what she's gaining out of this. 
it is is not run like any sort of wrestling promotion. It is is not designed to get heat. It is not designed to make people want to see it. It's just whoever's there. Is <laughs> is whoever's there? You just have to go on with the fact that you know they're supposed to be as good as Wild or David McLean or not just ain't tell you that they are. And this Mike Hunt guy that's been commentating on this, I don't know if he's being serious or not. I honestly don't. He's like, this is the best rivalry in this league. This is like Wild's version of the British Bulldogs versus the Hart Foundation in the eighties. I am. I absolutely hope that you are kidding Mike Hunt, whoever you are, wherever you are, because to say, and, and all due respect to the Tonga Twins and Miami Sweet, but to say that they or their matches are like the British Bulldogs and the, the Hart Foundation, <sighs> that's insulting to all four members of them, man, and three of them are dead. And it's still insulting to him. He should be turning over in their grave. Davy Boy, Dynamite, and and Nightheart, all of them. She'd be like, "What? They're like our matches. Bite your tongue." Anyhow, the match isn't important. <laughs> it's, it's because we've seen it a thousand times. Uh, they did fine for what they do. Uh, uh, I don't know why specifically. I, I if, uh, like Lori. I mean, there's they're probably very little difference between Lindsay and Lori. But for whatever reason, I, I've just kind of gravitated towards her. Um, I think it's how she sells. For there, there's times where she where she'll do a sell job, and I, I was like, oh, that's kind of nice. <laughs> Anyhow, like I said, I, I'm I, I all due respect to all members involved. I am glad that this is over with, even if it was through dubious means. Whether whatever you happen to believe in this particular instance, where they were fired, quit, or all of the above, I am glad that they are now forced to move on. My only downside here is that I think that while would do something silly like, all right, well, we don't have a choice now. We got to put the titles back on Miami Sweet Heat for the fourth and fifth time. So, I don't know. Time will tell. Anyhow, get into the end of the match because, like I said, the match in itself is not important. It's, it's, it's just, by and large, this is just a space filler. So, if you want to see the match, just go seek it out. And the end of the match... Tonga Twins, once they gain control, I think uh, both of the, of the Heat try to su- double suplex one of the Twins. I mean, they're both Twins, but one of the Tongas. And then the other sister comes in and saves her sister, and they double suplex the Miami Sweet Heat. Both members of the, of the Heat crawl towards their individual corners because we got to set this up and then Scheinberg does what Scheinberg does. He stands back there waving his arms like, hey, guys, stop it. The twins do their thing. They make a charge at both of them. Nigel Zane calls it a double hip attack. It was not a double hip attack. It was a splash and a hip attack. Although I will, I, I understand, Nigel, because like I said, sometimes – our minds as commentators race faster than what our words or <laughs> what we're processing. So I get it. It happens. Um, <laughs> I forgot that, you know, I skipped past a lot of notes here because, like I said, this this match wasn't all that important. And I, I really thought that they could have come up with a better main event than this. Sorry, but I did. <sighs> and then it got to the point where it was important. Now, after they did the splash and the hip attack, they decide to do it again. And Scheinberg is suspiciously sitting next or standing next to Lindsay. The twins make a charge. And this is probably a production thing because there was no good camera shot of this. 
Lindsay apparently pushes Scheinberg or pulls him into the way so he takes the brunt of the splash rather than Lindsay does. Although Laura still gets her attack, Lindsay is able to avoid it. Scheinberg takes it and since he's made of glass, he just crumbles over and falls and he stays knocked out for the duration of this. And I was like, are you goddamn kidding me? Are you telling me that this dude just crumpled up and fell and stayed unconscious and David McClane's like, we need medical help. I, what? He's knocked out. He's out cold. We need I was like, He got bumped and that was, I mean, yes, he's a small guy. And yes, you could get away with people believing that if one of the Tonga twins ran into him, that he might be incapacitated for a while, but knocked out. Come on. If anything, maybe crushed, and then he rolls out to the floor to try to get his breath, get his bearings, something like that, so he can get some kind of excuse for them to charge in was what they did, they being the Fabulous Four. But... uh, (laughs) This the oversell of this, and it was a complete oversell. Uh, you could buy that if Braun Breaker came charging full steam, and the guy gets out of the way, and he spears a ref out of his boots. You could believe that that guy would stay out and stay out cold, maybe for the duration of the show. You you might buy that. But this thing, Schomburg barely t- got touched. I mean, he barely, go back and watch it. He barely got touched. It's like a soft bump. And like I said, worst case scenario, maybe he crumbles up, falls to the floor because he, because she knocked the wind out of him. And that would be believable. But him just being just made of tissue paper or glass or whatever, it just... Oh, my gosh, he's out. He's out cold. He can't do anything. And that that just annoyed me to no ends. I mean, it, it was just horrible. So, anyhow, while this is happening, Lindsay's on the floor. Laura's down, and she's covered by one of the Tonga twins. And, of course, as I said before, because this happened, I mean, and – well, it's another case that we're waiting by the by the curtain because not goddamn one second after he bounces off to the ropes, you can see Vicky Lynn charging out the ringside to save the day. Didn't take two or three seconds. They were just standing there waiting. So Vicky Land and Penelope Pink come out there. So again, like I said, what was this whole ban about? When they just charged right back out there anyway. I tell you to stay out of the ring, they came out anyway. I tell you to leave without any consequences, they come right back. What was any of that for? What was any of that for? It was absolutely pointless. The only shining spot in this match and in this finish with the ref bump and all the stupidity that was going on was Tiki Chamorro came out with, with the kendo stick and laid into Vicky Lynn at least better than most people would do on this show. And I wanted to give you know give at least credit to that because that part at least made some kind of sense. Laurie had already rolled out the ring, right? Lana Starr didn't want any part of the of the violence that was going on. She didn't, so she kind of, even though she got in there, she scooted out almost immediately. <clears throat> Pink was in there doing some some work until she saw Chamorro come in there with the with the kendo stick, and when she saw her, she bailed. I shouldn't even say when she saw her. When she heard the pop of the kendo stick across Vicky Lynn's back, she bailed out on her. Which, again, you know, no honor amongst thieves. So I, I I could buy that. They were wailing away on the Tonga Twins. They were beating them up. Tomorrow comes out with an equalizer because she, she's a small young lady. So it makes sense that if she was going to do it, and, and that might be one of the first pro wrestling things I've seen her do. You know, 
Yes, it is a controlled thing and story driven and all that stuff, but it is pro wrestling and pro wrestling by its nature is violent. So she came out and did the violent thing. She brought a kendo stick and then she popped uh, Vicky Lynn across the back and Vicky Lynn fed for her. She, you can see that she she got her back prepped and ready to go. <laughs> she she uh, th- throttled one of the twins and before she got up, she kind of gave Tamara a second or two and then let her pop it across the back. The sound is what keyed Penelope Pink. She looks up, sees her with the kendo stick. She bails out. She's like, runs. And I thought that was, okay, that was great. As if, if anything saved this segment for me, it, it would have been Tiki, surprisingly enough. And Vicky Lynn, again, fed for her. She stood up. Well, she took the one across the back, stood up, got a, a shot on the thigh, and then she got another shot. So she got at least a good three still shots in there. And they, and they didn't look like they were, you know, tiny or, or non-painful or whatever the case may be. The, the, the good thing about a Kindle stick is the Kindle stick sounds off. So... Whether it's painful or not, in most cases it is. <laughs> this doesn't feel great. But she was willing to do that for the for the sake of the angle, even though, you know, unfortunately she's probably not gonna go anywhere with this because she's gone. <clears throat> she she came in uh, uh, Tiki came in for the save and she looked good doing it. She was she was my bright spot in this. Tiki Jamaro became my bright spot. And they gave her a situation where she was able to make the save in a believable fashion. So I was good with that. I was perfectly fine with that. Uh, the Tongas win by DQ. I didn't care for the match. Like I said, it was just, you know, it was what it was. <laughs> so, I, between the commentating, between David, between the ignoring, reapplication of, and re-ignoring of rules, it, it, this episode did me no favors. Did not care for it. I forgot to mention they had a segment in segment eight where they preview next week's debut of Roxy Ferris, and I'm I'm... Sadly, I'm already kind of dreading it. But we will see in a moment, I guess, how that works out when we catch the next episode where the Fierce Sisters get together. And will will Foxy Fierce get out of her losing ways with her sister? Time will tell. So that was the episode. And whereas... Animal Instinct and Teen Spirit was exactly what it needed to be. It was a squash match and Animal Instinct. It was placed in the wrong lineup for this series. Should have been done before the, the championship matches, in my opinion. Pink and Chamorro was the enjoyable match here because, again, the way it was worked, in my view, made sense. Chamorro was able to get a win, but she was able to get a believable win over, over Pink. It was not because she outdid Penelope Pink, she outmaneuvered her, and Pink somewhat cost herself. And Vicky Lynn somewhat cost her. Ice Cold and Jay Boogie, yeah, well, I mean, it was fine. And I just told you what I thought about Mammy Sweet Heat and all that. The, the commentating just drove a lot of this into the ground. David McClain's overacting drove a lot of this into the ground. The stipulations for or lack thereof drove a lot of this into the ground. It it just was not a overly enjoyable episode for me because of those things. If you if you removed the your band and then the uh ignoring of return to the talking about ice cold like we knew what he was talking about and all the little things 
Team Spirit has done well here. Animal Instinct has been great. And like, you know, it's, it's almost like Tony Khan when he talks about AEW. Regardless of what is going on and what happens and how he um, views anything, it's great. This is great. Everything is great. There's no problem. This is great. It's great. It's great. That's a lot of what he says. And that's how WoW in this particular episode felt like to me. Animal Instinct is doing good. Team Spirit is doing good. Ice Cold is great. Lil J Boogie is just coming along. It's like everybody is just progressing just fine. No one has any problems. No one has any stoner blocks. No one needs to work on anything. I mean, even in the kayfabe universe where they can say, ah, Jay Boogie was so close. She's, she's working so hard. She came up short, but damn it, if she, you know, maybe it's back to the drawing board, we still got faith, you know, something where somebody else can say those things, but they don't and they can't. So, outside elements of the matches would make this like a D. It's not a full-on F, but it is below average and is not because of the participants in the ring. It was because of how this show was put together and the things that went on outside of it. And I forgot to mention the, the disciplinary and Samantha Smart thing, which is absolutely nonsensical. So, there we have it. That is uh, the show, and it was interesting, to say the least. So now we have to go into our preview of the next episode. Here is your chance to jump ahead if you do not want to hear that. But I will already say that having read the title of this, I am I'm already dreading what I potentially could be in, in store for Never mind the fact that I was communicated with or I was having conversation with someone close to the circles of wow who pretty much forewarned me that this is probably not going to be a good episode. Uh, I, I hope, I hope, I hope that that is an exaggeration. But we will see. So let's read this preview. Season 2, episode 44. Well, 244 for me. And it'll be chronologically the 96th episode that airs. The title will be Breaking Coach's Grip. I already do not like it. Like, How much more does she need to do to get out of this? So... Here we go. Samantha Smart assures that her team of the class master and the disciplinarian are stronger and clear headed to finally challenge the mother truckers for the championship tag team titles in what is sure to be a lively action packed main event. <sighs> I'm going to stop right there and I'm going to take a look at my notes just for a second. Here. Just, just. When did the Classmaster have her championship match? Was that a week ago? Okay, so by the time this episode will air, it will be two weeks. So in two weeks' time, Classmaster will have gotten a title shot at single titles and loss, and then somehow granted another title a title shot for the tag titles with somebody who loses constantly. Makes a lot of sense to me. <sighs> anyway, why are the Mother Truckers facing off against every job team that they have? Where, where are their competitions? Where's their rivals at? Anyway, moving on. Where did I leave off? Uh, we'll just go back. We'll finally challenged the Mother Truckers for the championship tag titles in what should be a lively action back main event. After withstanding a vicious attack from top tier, <laughs> vicious attack, the All American girls, Santana Garrett and Americana, and their newfound friend, Ariel Sky, set out to beat their bullies in the ring. But will it be enough to keep Coach Campanelli off their backs? 
Foxy and Roxy Fierce sisters and Howard University alumni face off against Sarah the Voodoo Doll and her unrelenting partner, Chainsaw. Oh, yeah, because I know being a Howard University alumni means a lot when you're wrestling. The Brat Packs, BK Rhythm and GG Diani go head to head against the dangerous martial arts pair, the Dojo Defenders. Surprises are revealed that will shake up the future of WoW World Championship title, or the WoW World Championship title. So let's see. If I were going to take guesses here, and I was specifically not going out of my way to see this because they do upload these episodes about 24 hours ahead of time when it runs. You can <laughs> At work, we can kind of breeze through it on the server if we really wanted to. Uh, all right. I'm pretty sure that the mother truckers are going to retain and the class master and disciplinarian and that this is probably her swan song or something like that. I assume the disciplinarian will either cause the loss or she will be the one to get pinned. That's my guess. Uh, I would guess that the All-American Girls and Ariel Sky would defeat top tier, which will further cement them as just a another team, another faction that's not going to go anywhere because, you know, why? And what was the other one? The Siren, the Voodoo Doll, and Chainsaw against Foxy and Roxy Fierce, which is a tough sell because WoW has a history of having their debut people go out there and lose and Foxy has a horrible record but then again theoretically Roxy Fierce is not this isn't a debut for her now, it's, a de- it's an in ring debut but it's not a debut for her since she was able to just to hop the rail and defeat Chainsaw and you might as well just finish her up right now because if if, if Roxy is the winning element over Chainsaw then Chainsaw has lost all her mojo and the Brat Packs BK Rhythm and GG Gianni against the Dojo Defenders which is like two it's the same thing that I said with Animal Instinct and, and Team Spirit is basically two job teams that are facing off the only good thing that you can get out of this is that one of them has to win and I honestly don't know who would win this other than the fact that the Brat Pack I've pretty much given up on I like I love the team, but I don't think they're going to go anywhere. They're not going to move up the ladder. They're not going to win any titles there. So it's probably going to be the Dojo Defenders finally scoring their first win against the Brat Pack. Now, that is my guess. So, yeah, that's a lot of stuff to, I guess, look forward to. I don't know. This has been a long episode. (laughs) This has been... uh, uh, filled with stuff, but it's been a long episode, longer than what I thought I was gonna do. But but it was all built on Wow. All the all the extra talk was all built on Wow, which is what I'm here to do in the first place. So there we have it. So you know what we need to do now? We need to have you go to WPN's page and go take some of those quizzes on the community tab. If I have any other posts specifically the press release or something like that you'll probably be able to find it there <clears throat> if not there it might be on instagram and facebook as well and this is a good point to wrap things up be sure to check out the website wpnwrestling.com because it has everything that we do podcast drop there the 24 hour stream 24 hours a day seven days a week is always there might be a match on you know at this particular moment i didn't i did an automated playlist today so i i honestly do not know what is airing at this particular moment as i record but when i turned it on you know what matches on there aja prayer versus the priscilla kelly two women that have gone on to the wwe one in the wrestling capacity the other one as a referee but it's just interesting to see those people who make those jumps and then move on to big or bigger and better things but you get a lot of faces like that on that channel. A lot of faces that have come in, done some stuff, really talented people who have grown. As I said earlier, Kelsey Heather won her Shine Nova Championship. She's clearly grown. And not for nothing, and all due respect to Wild, that title will probably 
do more for her career than anything that any wild championship because they have not established a wild championship as being anything important. Maybe they will one day. Time will tell and that's the one other thing that we got. They got some major shakeups going on with the wild championship. So we'll see what that is. So on that note, folks, thank you for tuning in and listening to the program. As always, your time is appreciated. Your comments, messages, direct messages, open messages, all of them, all of them are all appreciated. And I look forward to the next set of them so we can continue our conversations on what's going on in the future. And on that note, folks, it's time to close it up. And I will close it by saying that this is Mr. Green saying that this is Mr. Green saying so long. And we will see you on the next go round. Take care, everybody. Thank you for listening to the WPN's Rights and Wrongs of Pro Wrestling. If you have questions or comments, please contact us via our Facebook or our YouTube channel at the Women's Pro Wrestling Network. If you're new to the WPN, feel free to subscribe to our channel and like our page. We appreciate your support. Thank you again for listening.